what are the ingredients to make this? You know, this sense of place is a really mysterious thing. The National Endowment for the Arts has given lots of studies to achieve, how do you achieve sense of place? Lots of money has been spent on paving and banners and lighting and all that. And yet, sense of place is something that any surveyor or any farmer throughout the 19th century was able to achieve without even thinking twice. All the old towns, in fact, have sense of place. It's only where planners are active that sense of place is elusive. And the problem is that it is just too simple to be worthy of a professional expertise. And it involves just two elements. The first one is as simple as this room. This is a place because it's a room. This is a room because there are walls. Okay. Whenever buildings make walls, the street feels like a room and it feels okay to be there. It's a sense of place. Whenever buildings are spinning and shaking and rotating, in the desperate and futile attempt to act independently, they destroy the wall and they destroy the ability to make a sense of place. That is why this is a street in, in Alexandria where people come to. That is why this is a parking lot, which is a sociofugal space where people flee. Sociofugal means people flee, people come out of their cars and go indoors. Sociopetal means it attracts people. People drive for hours to spend an afternoon in a place like this. The way it's done is, well, it's really the architect's fault. The architects have developed a fashion of staggering back and forth as often as the budget will allow. Uh, in the attempt to, to actually establish individuality, but actually just not achieving individuality, but merely destroying, uh, the, destroying the, uh, the possibility of space. The ingredients are exactly the same. Unit, dwelling unit, landscaping, parking, uh, asphalt cars. Dwelling unit, landscaping, asphalt cars. But this adds up to something that is so important to people that people who buy here pay six times as much for this box as they will for this box. So if you think that I'm being a bit theoretical now, there is nothing theoretical about people pulling out their wallets and overpaying for these. Because that's what happens every time one of these occurs. The paradox, or rather the irony, is that this actually costs less to build. Because articulating in section like this not only gives you as much individuality as, as that, but it costs less than articulating in plan. What could be more expensive than all these extra corners and all of these complexities in the roof? Any architect that does not provide for their developer this is really actually doing a developer a disservice because this costs nothing and it has an extraordinary value, perceived value added to it. All of the towns that we have designed outperform the suburban the suburban condition. And the fundamental trick is simply to line the buildings up like that. Now, you can't count on the architects doing that. So if you're interested in achieving this, you must code it with build two lines with a certain discipline. For example, you should have a frontage line. And you must build a minimum of your frontage. You, you must place a, a building, building on your frontage a minimum percentage of the lot width as opposed to the current code that says, look, as long as you don't build in the front 25 feet, you can do anything you want. You can rotate, you can jump, anything. <laughs> the traditional codes work differently. You must build up to a line to achieve the sense of place. Now, there's another ingredient. The second, in I've only given you one ingredient so far. It's very simple. Line up the buildings. The second ingredient, which has been known since the Renaissance, is the height to width ratio. Okay? In order to achieve a sense of place, you cannot exceed the height, the bounding wall is the height, the width between buildings is the width. You cannot exceed a height to width ratio of one to six. If you exceed one to six, the buildings might be lined up, but it doesn't feel like a space. The Renaissance theoreticians preferred one to three, one to three, like this. But one to six is the maximum. Now, unfortunately, in American suburbia, Americans like their houses low, and they like their front yards wide. So very often, you find that the one to six ratio has been exceeded, at which point it is necessary to plant trees all in a row. These trees are not there for ornamental reasons. They're there to correct the spatial deficiency of that street, which is too wide. So the first task of the landscape architect is to correct the spatial deficiency of the planner. 
The second task is to make things pretty. That unfortunately is not what landscape architects have been doing. What they've been doing is making things pretty first and then see what happens later. This is an instance, a typical instance, this is downtown Homestead, which is a place that was missing in sense, that was lacking in sense of place to the higher landscape architect. The landscape architect considers it dishonorable to line up more than two trees in a row because it's uncreative and probably he thinks it's unecological. So he has the Everglades move in like this, you know, all these things all over. And then he says, well, this is not working. And nervously, he adds brick to it. And finally, in desperation, he tattoos a flower, you see, <laughs> on the paving. Now, all this photographs very well. This stuff looks good. And that's why landscape architects do it. It looks great. But when you're there, there's no sense of place. There's a big difference between a good-looking public space and a public space that has a sense of place. <coughs> This is something that should be in the codes also because, as, as, I, as I've said, landscape architects have a tendency to not line up trees. They don't think it's creative enough. If you are going to have picturesque planting, that should be, that should be confined to parks. Parks are there to simulate nature. Streets and avenues have another purpose, and it is not to simulate nature. Another perfectly simple reason why we don't have pedestrian life in residential neighborhoods has to do with houses like this. Now, these houses in many ways are okay. They have nice materials. They, don't, they have nice shapes. The landscaping is good. The problem is that the only information that they're giving is that cars live there. You see? Here the cars live independently. Here the cars are shacked up. But other than that, other than that, that is of no great interest except to very recent immigrants who are, are still fascinated by the business of the cars. And yet, <coughs> Well, take this. This is the, this is the alternative in a, in, a, um, in, a, in a town that is full of tourists called Stewart, Florida. This architecture is not superior to this one. They're both boxes. The difference is that all the information that this house is giving is about people. People turn the lights on and off. People stand behind windows. People have newspapers here on the stoop. Now, what happens is that, that humans are a very gregarious species, and they love people and what they do. They watch each other a lot. This house is full of people activity, or potential people activity. This one is not. So you get pedestrian life here, and you don't get pedestrian life here. In fact, I happen to know this is a place called Wellington in Florida, where we're now doing the 1,600-acre extension. The people in Wellington take drive to the exercise uh, club where they do where they use the walking machines that's actually what they do now how is that to be achieved how can you overcome the problem of the garage when you have a small lot I mean after all if you have a 50 foot lot and you have two parked cars that's taking up 50 percent of your frontage no architect can overcome that it will eat up the frontage what you need are alleys or lanes like this the old system of alleys and lanes permits people to park from the rear that's why the old neighborhoods here in San Antonio feel so much, look so much better. It's not that the housing is necessarily superior, because it's actually not that different. Some of the new housing looks pretty good. It's just that the old housing is not showing a high percentage of garage doors. So they're, they're automatically, uh, they subconsciously would consider them friendlier. This, not only the cars in the back, but the trash cans in the back are a great asset. And the infrastructure, especially the cables and the pipes, when they're to the rear, you don't have to mangle the trees in front. To tr you know, with, with the and even when they're buried, even when the cables are buried, as they often are these days, if they're in the front, they're preventing the planting for, of trees to occur there, which immediately widens the street. And as you know, or as I said earlier, the narrower the street, the more popular it is. In fact, I have an entire series of slides that show how in every city, the highest real estate value coincides with the narrowest street. It's exactly the opposite of what developers think. It's a remarkable situation. The most elegant shopping street, the most elegant living street in Boston, in San Francisco, in Miami, the narrowest is the one with the highest real estate value. People love space, love tight spaces. <clears throat>